Is your right hand? Okay. Not many right hands. Okay. Left hand? Raise your left hand. Okay. Good. Is it starting to work? All right. If it's not working, then uh, I'm sure there's somebody ready to help you. So uh, I bring you greetings from Antioch Bible Church in Johannesburg, South Africa. It's great to be with you and to also bring you greetings from my wife and my five children. Uh, how many of you did I, how many of you uh, 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 did I meet before when I was here two years ago? Raise your hand if I've met you on the previous trips that we made uh, over, over many years. Many of the Baptist brothers I recognize and uh, uh, met you in uh, 2012 and 13 and 14 and 15 and uh, also uh, 2016. It's been a great privilege for us at Antioch Bible Church to uh, be able to partner with you through a relationship with the, uh, the Baptist brothers here and the other churches and uh, especially with uh, Fali and with Hadza and it's such a great privilege to be able to open God's Word with you and to be back here now after uh, it's been two years now and uh, it's one of my greatest joys to visit Madagascar every year it's one of the highlights uh, for my ministry and my wife and my children my church will tell you that uh, it's uh, nobody has to twist my arm it's something that I, I jump at the first opportunity and it's such a joy to see what the Lord is doing here in your beautiful country and uh, open up God's Word with you now. So turn in your Bibles to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. See, we have a few people who are still uh, sorting out their headphones. I'm glad I can be a guinea pig. However, I can be useful. Psalm 19. Keep your hand up if you're still needing the headphones. Thank you for coming to this conference. It's wonderful to see all of you. I know that many of you made a great effort and came from very far to be here. Let's see, who, who traveled the farthest to come to this conference? Uh, uh, if you, if, how many of you did it take you more than, more than one day to come to this conference? Raise your hand if it took you more than one day to travel here. Two days? Did some of you take three days to come here? Probably. Who do you think comes from the farthest, Hadza? How far? Yeah, okay. Probably the north, huh? Yeah, be the farthest. So I know sometimes four days even to travel here. Well, thank you for coming. I'm glad that you made the effort that we could be here together. There are many things that we do not know about, and it's not going to hurt your church. There's many questions that you have. It's not going to kill your ministry. There's many things that we're not certain about, that we're not sure about. Things in science, things in engineering, things in, in, in medicine, things in many different fields of knowledge, right? There are, uh, it, it's, it's, it's fine, it's natural to have questions, it's human to not know everything. Only God knows everything, right? So you don't need to be clear. You don't need to be sure and convinced of everything about what will happen to your favorite sports team and in soccer or rugby or what's going to happen in politics or the economy or in the government. You don't have to be confident about all of those things. It won't affect your church. It's not going to harm or to hurt your ministry. However, there's one thing you must be sure about. There is one book that you must believe in. There is one thing you must be very confident about or it will destroy your ministry. It will kill your church if you are not sure about the Word of God and what the Bible can do. If you are not convinced about what the Bible can do and will do in your ministry, that question is dangerous. This you must be confident about. And so if you are here today wanting to increase your confidence in the Bible, to decrease your doubts, to 
make smaller your questions and your fears about the Bible and to make larger your confidence in the Word of God, Psalm 19 is a perfect place to go. I cannot think of a better solution to improve your confidence and to enlarge your, your boasting and your excitement about the Word of God than to study Psalm 19. Am I speaking at a good pace now? A little bit slower. Okay, sure. All right. Mora, mora. Right? Psalm 19 is one of the earliest and oldest expressions in all the Bible about the Bible, about the power of the Word of God, what it is, what it can do. It's one of the clearest and one of the most concise and one of the best expressions of the authority of Scripture, the perfection of Scripture, the in, really the inerrancy of Scripture, the infallibility of Scripture. Psalm 19 stands alone as unique among all the Psalms, among all the Scriptures, in what it says about the Word of God, what the Word of God is, what the Word of God can do. Psalm 19 is the most familiar and one of the most loved poems in all of the Bible. Some would say it's one of the most famous poems in all of world literature, the 19th Psalm. And it covers such a vast expanse. It has a massive sweep, you could say. Psalm 19 begins by looking at the stars. And it ends by looking inside of your own soul. And to get from the stars to your own soul, it passes through the scriptures. So it covers the universe. It turns you outward and upward. And then it turns you Godward and Bibleward towards the scriptures. And it ends by turning you inward to your own soul. And then back up to the Lord, my rock and my redeemer, as we're about to see. Psalm 19 is about a God who talks, a God who reveals himself. There was a famous book by uh, Francis Schaeffer. Some of you may know the name. Francis Schaeffer. He, has a, uh, he also ministered in, in French and English in Switzerland. And his, he had a book called God is There and He is Not Silent. We, have, we serve a talking God. A God who doesn't want to hide himself, but a God who wants to reveal himself. Imagine if you were trying to have a friendship or a, a relationship with someone who never talked. What kind of friendship would that be? With someone who never communicated. They never revealed themselves. They never told you anything about themselves. How deep would that friendship be? How good would that relationship be? It'd be very weak. It'd be very shallow, right? Relationship depends upon revelation. Upon disclosing or manifesting or making yourself known. Praise God. We serve a God who reveals himself, who delights to make himself known. How does he do that? Psalm 19 is all about the revelation of God who likes to show himself and to tell us who he is and what he is like. And he does it through two books. Psalm 19 is about the two books of God. The book of his general revelation and the book of his special revelation. The book of nature and the book of scripture. Watch as we read and watch the climax and see which is the best of God's books. Which is the climax? Which is the greatest and the clearest and the most important of the ways that God reveals himself? Let me read the psalm and then we will pray. Psalm 19. For the choir director, a psalm of David. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth, and their utterances to the ends of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. It ri its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. 
and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, they are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Please join me as we pray. Our Father, thank you that you are a speaking God that you are a talking, revealing God who makes yourself known so that we might know who you are and what you are like and what it means to know you and what it means to live with you and for you in this world, to know why you have made us, to know how you want us to live and how we can be saved from our sin. Thank you that you have shown the light of your revelation into this dark world. Thank you for these two books, both written by the same author, the one true and living God. Thank you for your world of nature. Thank you for your word in scripture. Teach us now, we pray, that we might see your glory, that we might love you more, that we might praise you better, that we might respond rightly to your revelation and understand who you are and be rescued from the lies and the foolishness of sin and evil and Satan and from this world, that we might know the truth and walk in it, and that our churches will be built upon the faithful teaching and preaching of your word. Thank you for each of my brothers and sisters who are here, each of the men who are here, who are faithful shepherds and pastors and preachers of your word. We pray for this entire conference. Thank you for Fali and Hadza and for all the team from the 3M ministry who have labored to prepare for this conference, we pray that as a result, every church represented here from all across this island would be strengthened, would be built up, that each of them would be faithful pillars of truth, that hold high and keep safe sound doctrine so that the lost sinners would be saved and so that your people would be built up and all of your elect brought in and your kingdom advanced across this beautiful island for the glory of Christ and for the spread of your powerful word. Thank you that your word is able to do your work in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I think you saw the title on the screen, The Superiority of Scripture, or if you would like to call it, The Best of All the Books. The Best of All the Books. I love the words of John Wesley, a famous preacher. He once said this. He said, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven. God himself has condescended. He has come down to teach that way. He has written it in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I trust that's the cry of your heart this morning as we open up Psalm. Superiority of Scripture, the power of God's Word for your life, for your ministry. And if it doesn't change the way that you preach and the way that you minister, it's because we don't understand the power and the potential of God's Word, the superiority of Scripture over any other message or any other method that would control our ministry. It's my joy to be a a pastor and a preacher of God's Word now for the past 20 years in South Africa. Our church now is in Johannesburg. Who has been to Johannesburg? Have any of you been to Johannesburg? A few of you, all right? It's what we say at, uh, at Passover, right? Next year in Johannesburg. You say that? Next time you will. You're welcome anytime. It's a joy to minister in South Africa and to see the Word of God at work in people's lives. I want you to look, so that we're going to look at three sections. First of all, verse 1 through 6, 
then verse 7 through 11, and then the final section will be verses 12 through verse 14. All pointing to and building up to this climax of the superiority of Scripture. Look for it. First of all, we're going to look at the word, the world of God, God's world in verses 1 to 6. One sentence for this would be his relentless revelation, proclaiming his glory. It is his relentless, unstopping revelation that shows his glory, God's world. Look at verse 1 as we look at this first section, as the psalmist begins. He says, the heavens are, are telling of the glory of God. Their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. As I said, I'm blessed with five children. And when they were younger, and we would be uh, 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 taking them outside, going for a walk or going for uh, uh, playtime, sometimes we would see the sun rising or the sun setting or the beautiful clouds. And I would say to my young boys or girls, do you hear the sermon? Do you hear the preaching that is coming from the clouds? And they would say, Dad, what do you mean? And I would say, the glory of God. If there is artwork, there must be an artist. If there is a book, there must be an author, right? If there's a building, there must be an architect behind it. The heavens are preaching. What are they preaching? God made us. We did not invent ourselves. There is a designer behind all of this design. There is a maker behind all that is made. He is great. He is glorious. Heavens are telling the glory of God. The expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Keep reading verse 2. Day after day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. The, the, the original Hebrew here reminds me of your very musical culture here in Madagascar. The Hebrew says, Yom le yom, laila le laila. Can you hear the rhythm? Yom le yom, laila le laila. The song keeps going. Creation keeps telling us of the greatness of God and the glory of the Creator. Daytime is not enough, so it spills over into nighttime. Creation can't stop talking. Nature can't stop telling us about how great the Creator is. On and on, the message keeps going. You can't push pause. You can't stop. You don't need to download it. It doesn't require headphones. The preaching goes on and on and on and on and on. Keep reading, verse 3. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. It's a silent witness to the Creator, yes? There's no text. There's no verbs. There's no nouns. There's no written language. You don't have to be literate. You don't have to be educated. You don't have to have degrees from a university, right? Creation continues to speak and to shout and to preach and to proclaim the greatness of the Creator. And everyone knows it in the farthest islands, in the remotest regions, in all places. God is making His glory known. Every Christian father or mother Every Christian pastor will be asked this question by young people. They say to you, what about those who have never heard about Jesus? Will they be saved? What about those people in the remote places, some even in your, on your island here, yes, who have not heard yet about Jesus? Can they be saved? How do you answer that question? Do they have an excuse? Can they say, but nobody told me? But I did not know. How can I go to hell? How can I be condemned if, they never, if I never heard? What is our answer, brothers and sisters? As preachers of the Bible, there's only one answer. They are without excuse. Romans chapter 1. They heard. They knew. They saw. There is a God. They should seek Him. They should turn from their idols. They should stop suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Romans chapter 1 tells us from verse 18 and following, God's glory, God's power, God's nature has been clearly seen through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Yes? Because of this general revelation, because of the first book that God has written through His world. Keep going. 
verse 4 continues now with a very specific emphasis. Look at verse 4. In the heavens he has placed a tent. God built a house. God made a dwelling place for what? He breathed for the sun. Verse 5. Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. It's rising as from one end of the heavens. It's circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. You want to pick the best runner who will win a race? Next time you are uh, having a race in your village or in your town, if you want to pick who's the fastest man, pick a man who got married yesterday. <laughs> he will always win the race. <laughs> because he was just with his bride and the honeymoon has begun. In our church, we've had many weddings lately. You should see the young men when they come back from their honeymoon. God is saying that's what the sun is like. But the sun is not the hero. Many pagan cultures worship the sun because they forget there was a sun maker. There was a sun designer. There was a sun architect who created the sun. And the glory doesn't go to the sun. The glory goes to the one who made the sun. The living God, right? Who put the sun there? Who tells the sun when to run? And when to stop? Who Matt, Matt drew out the course for the sun? The creator. God. The one true God. Yes? The living God. He put the sun there. Somebody has said, when you talk to these really clever scientists who think that everything evolved and that we all came from monkeys and there's no creator and they are atheists, some of them have come to faith in Jesus Christ. A few scientists have been saved. And someone said, it's like the scientists are climbing the mountain of all of this knowledge and all of this learning and all of this intellectual uh, research. And then finally, some of them discover that there is a creator. There must be an intelligent designer behind everything. And they get to the top of the mountain. And who do they find at the top of the mountain after all of their years of study and learning and more learning and more learning? They get to the top of all their knowledge. And the pastors are sitting at the top and the theologians. And we say, hello, where have you been? We knew this all along. We could have told you. Why did it take you so long to see? There's a creator. There is a God behind all that has been made. He reveals his glory relentlessly. He proclaims his power through his world. But number two, we come now to verse 7 through 11. You and I would not be here today. We would not be having this conference. I would not be preaching this sermon. We would not be pastoring churches if it was not for the second book, the better book the best of books, the most powerful book. More than general revelation is special revelation. More than the power of God's glory in creation is the clarity of His glory in Scripture. More transforming, more life-changing, more necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you listening? Creation can only condemn you. It cannot save you. Nature can only show you that you need God. Nature cannot tell you how to know God, how to be reconciled to God. Nature cannot tell you that God has a son who he sent to die on a cross for sinners, to rise again on the third day to save you from your sins. You cannot learn that from the sunrise or the sunset or from the forest or the mountains or the beach or the oceans. You learn that from the Bible. Only the Word of God can tell you that. The greatest of all God's revelation. And if the first book of God's world is a relentless revelation of His glory, then we could say the second book of God's Word is a rewarding revelation that produces godly character. That would be the second sentence to go with the second point. 
God's word is his rewarding revelation which produces a godly character. The books are not equal. It's not like a democratic election. God does not say each book, one book, one vote. Not so. The second book is far more powerful, far more persuasive, far more important. It's God's special revelation in the scriptures. Why do you think David, the psalmist, goes from talking about the sun to talking about the scriptures? What do you think might be the connection? It's not hard to see, is it? I think David is thinking in verse 5 and 6 about the warmth of the sun and the light of the sun, and it makes him think of an even greater heat and an even greater light, the searching light of Scripture, the persuasive power of the Word of God. So he goes to a greater book, to a greater light, to a greater power, the Word of God. In Psalm verses 7 up to verse 9, in three verses we have these six different beautiful statements about Scripture. It's like a, a diamond with six different sides. Have you ever seen a beautiful diamond or a beautiful gem, a precious gem? You, you, you want to look at it and from every possible angle to see the way the light is shining from that gem, don't you? So it is with the Scriptures here. In verse 7, 8, and 9, we have six different titles for Scripture. David says that God's Word is His law, it's His testimony, it's His precepts, it's His commandments, it's the fear of the Lord, it's the, the judgments or the rules of the Lord. And notice, they are all of the Lord. Six times it is God's Word, it is God's statutes, it is God's precepts, it's God's commandments. And then notice also there are six characteristics given of the scriptures here in verse 7, 8, and 9 to cause us to celebrate the Word of God, to trust the Word of God, to love the Word of God more as David does. He says it is God's Word is perfect and it is sure and it is right and it is pure and it is clean, it is true. And he's not finished. Also in verse 7, 8, and 9 he wants to tell us about the effect that the Word of God can have on us, what the Bible can do in your life and in the life of those that you minister to. He says it can revive the soul, verse 7. It can make wise the simple. And then verse 8, he says it can rejoice the heart. It can enlighten the eyes. Verse 9, it can endure forever and it is altogether righteous. I love the way one preacher has put it. He says the Holy Spirit in this one section in these three verses has summed, summed up everything that we need to know about the power of Scripture and the sufficiency and the authority and the trustworthiness and the comprehensiveness of the Word of God. It's what Scripture is and it's what it does. You remember the famous words of the great uh, uh, preacher from London, Charles Spurgeon, when they said, how do you defend the Bible? Do you remember the answer from Spurgeon? I know some of you know this. I used it in the past when I was here. Spurgeon said, I don't need to, I defend the Bible the way I defend a lion. Open the cage and let it out. It will defend itself. Let the lion loose. Unleash scripture and all of its power, all of its beauty, all of its potential, right? What the Word of God is, he tells us here in verse 7, 8, and 9, right? It is perfect, it is sure, it is right, it is pure, it is clean, it is true. Now, each of these could be a whole sermon in itself, right? And then he tells us what the Word of God does. Imagine when God does this in your life, in the life of the people that you minister to. I remember when... One of my mentors, Pastor John MacArthur, when I was still a teenager and I was a new Christian, maybe age 16 or 17, and I heard Dr. MacArthur preaching this sermon when he was visiting where I lived. And I can still remember the place I was sitting. And I had grown up in a shallow church with topical sermons 
that did not really take the Bible seriously, did not teach verse by verse. It relied more upon man's wisdom than upon the expository preaching and the, the teaching of the Bible. And then I was sitting there listening to a man teaching the Bible verse by verse where the, 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 the Bible was driving the car, not the preacher. <laughs> and the power of God's Word was let loose. And I realized I had such a terribly small view of God's Word and I needed to have a much bigger and bigger and bigger view of, of God's Word and what it is and what it can do, which we'll be spending for the next four days talking about, right? From many different places, the, we will be seeing how the Word of God is a, it's a double-edged sword. It's living and active, right? It is breathed out by God. It is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The, the Bible is enough. The Bible is all we need, would need. Why would you preach anything else except for the Bible? Do you have some greater power? Nothing can convert dead sinners, he says here. Nothing can, look in verse 7, restore people's souls who are wandering. Uh, make wise people who are simple and foolish, and they desperately need wisdom. Verse 8, depressed people who need joy. Where can you find greater joy if not in the Word of God? The Word of God brings light to dark eyes. It's a lamp to our feet, right? The light to our path. Why would you want to leave people in darkness by preaching anything else? They don't need to know about me or my stories or my experience. My congregation needs light that will only come from this book and from this Word, right? He continues there in verse 9. Only this book will last forever. Everything else you say will expire it will be irrelevant. It will be outdated. It will not be contemporary when tomorrow comes. But when you speak things that are eternal, you are always relevant. And the Word of God is, has permanent relevance. It endures forever, right? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God endures forever, right? And verse 9 concludes, they are righteous altogether. God's Word is perfect, it's blameless, it's pure, it's without error, as the other speakers will be referring to further. It is not diluted, it is not contaminated, it has no errors, it can be completely trusted. It's always right about whatever it talks about. Verse 7, 8, and 9, it's what God's Word is, it's what God's Word does. You could preach a whole sermon on each of these six phrases describing the sufficiency, the, the power of God's Word. But we must continue. I'll finish. David responds, actually. Let's read next David's own response, and then I'll finish this section with an illustration. How, does, how should this make us feel? If we understand the, the potential, the credentials, the pedigree, the qualifications of this book, which is the best of books, right? Creation and nature cannot purify you, cannot make you wise, cannot convert you, cannot bring light into your life, cannot do all of those things in verse 7, 8, and 9. You can't learn that from nature. That book from God is not enough. This is enough. Only this Word of God can save your lost soul, can sanctify your life, can build your church. The Word of God can do the work of God in your life, in your church, in your pulpit, right? And so when we believe that, when we understand that, our only response is verse 10, to say with David, oh, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to the comb. Once there was a Jewish mother and she wanted the children to learn this lesson well. So she took the Old Testament. These were Jews. They only believed the Old Testament. And she got a big pot of honey. And she got a big stick. And she dipped it deep in the pot with a big lump or dollop of honey because she wanted all her boys and girls to understand the point she was making. And she took the stick with all the honey and she stuck it on top 
of their Old Testament. And she went around the table and she required every one of the children to make a point that they would never forget. You must love the Word of God. And we are Christians. We do not have only the Old Testament. We also have the New Testament. The veil for us has been lifted in Christ. How much more we should say, Oh, we love the Word of God. Nothing is sweeter. Nothing satisfies me. Nothing is more uh, joyful. Nothing makes me smile. Nothing uh, changes my life like this book, right? So David continues. Look at the next verse, verse 11. What the Word of God more of what the Word of God is and what it does in our life. Look at what he says there in verse 11. By them, speaking of the Scriptures, from verse nine, 7, 8, and 9, moreover, by them your servant is warned. How else will you know when to watch out? Be careful. Stay away. Don't go there. Only from God's Word. This book will keep you away from sin or sin will keep you away from this book. I repeat, this book will keep you away from sin, or sin will keep you away from this book. The warnings come from here, and the reward comes from here, he says. Keep reading, verse 11, in keeping them, there is great reward. This is the best salary, the best payment, the best prize, the greatest treasure that you could ever imagine from knowing God's Word and living God's Word. And now we come to the third and the final section. We saw verse 1 to 6, God's world, His relentless revelation which proclaims His glory. And then we saw verse 7 through 11, God's Word, His rewarding revelation which produces godly character. And now, our prayer. Verse 12 to 14. Our prayer and our response to God's Word. What must it do? What must it cause us to say? How must we respond to this best of all books? This is how we respond. Verse 12. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me, Lord, of hidden faults. Look up here for a moment. Do you know all the sins you've committed from when you woke up today? When did you wake up this morning? Show me, show me the number on your fingers. Did you wake up? Uh, I woke up at 5 o'clock. What time did you wake up this morning? Did you wake up 4 o'clock? 5 o'clock? 8 o'clock! No, I'm just kidding. From the time you woke up this morning, how many sins have you committed? Can you count them? Can you show me? You cannot. Because you don't know. Only He knows. It's too many to count. So we need this Word, this light, to shine on our darkness. To say, Lord, show me the sins I don't even realize. I don't even know that I'm committing. But He's not finished. Look what He says next. He says also, verse 13, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Those are the willful, the intentional, the deliberate, high-handed, stubborn sins that we commit. And they can dominate and control our lives if you let them. Then, he says, I will be blameless. It's what the elder and the pastor must be as a leader of the church, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Blameless. It's the desire of every Christian and the goal of the believer to be blameless. And I shall be acquitted of great transgression. And then, this beautiful concluding words in verse 14. Something that nature cannot produce. Only Scripture can produce this prayer in us. You cannot learn this from God's world. You only learn it from God's Word. Only God's book, the best of books, can bring you down so low to this place that you will play, pray a prayer like this. Verse 14, let the words of my mouth 
and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the language of an Old Testament sacrifice uh, in the temple. A sweet aroma, a, a pleasing fragrance that rises up to God. O Lord, let my words be like that that nice smell in the temple when the Jews brought their offerings. Oh, Heavenly Father, make my words like that before you. And not just my words, but even my thoughts that no one else can see, that only you know, oh Lord, not even my children, not even my wife, but Lord, you know them, every one of my thoughts, my meditations in my deepest heart, where the Word of God is going to work, shining and convicting and cleansing and washing and changing me. Oh Lord, may I please you even in my meditations in my heart. May it all be acceptable in your sight. And then look where he finishes. The final line takes us back to where the psalm began. He began looking upward. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And he's turned us upward. But then the scripture turns us inward in verses 7 through 11. And then he prays about his own sin. And at the end, he looks back, away from himself. And he looks upward. This time, not only to the Creator, but also to the Savior. Remember, general revelation is only enough to condemn you. You need special revelation to save you. Nature can only tell you there's a creator. Nature cannot tell you he has a son who became the redeemer. So David concludes by saying, Oh Lord, my rock. God is unchanging, immovable, like Gibraltar, like a mighty fortress, like a great refuge. That Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is our great rock. We can stand upon him. We can run to him. We can rely upon him. He will never be shaken. He is not affected by the circumstances. He is not changed by any of the difficulties of this life, the economy, the election, your health, your weather. He is my rock. And then, how does it end? He is my redeemer, my Goel, my Boaz. Jesus, who can save me from my sin. I'll leave you with this. All of it points to Christ, doesn't it? All of it points us to the Lord Jesus. Creation was made by Him. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him. Apart from Him, nothing was made that has been made, right? Jesus was with the Father, creating all of general revelation. Jesus is the theme of special revelation. It, these bear witness of me, Jesus says, right? The scriptures are about him. God's world is from Jesus and for Jesus. God's word is from Jesus and for Jesus and about Jesus. And our prayer must be centered around Jesus. So brothers and sisters, next time you go to enjoy the outdoors, maybe you're at the beach, Maybe you're walking among the trees. Maybe you're just sitting around the fire with some friends and you look up at the stars. Don't stop there. After you see the stars or the ocean or the sunrise or the sunset or the rolling clouds or the beautiful sun, whenever you're enjoying the world of God, don't stop there. Turn to the Word of God. Don't stop looking at the stars. Open the scriptures, and you'll see even more beauty, more majesty, more glory, life-changing truth that can only be found in the scriptures. And this must change the way we preach. Why would we not want to preach this book? Why would we want to waste time on doing anything else in the pulpit but teaching this verse, this Bible, verse by verse, word by word, page by page, chapter by chapter, book by book? The power to save people, the power to change people, to grow them, to sanctify them, to strengthen the church, to bring them wisdom, to bring them joy, to give them hope 
is not going to be found in creation. It's only found in Scripture. The best of all books. The superiority of Scripture. Let's pray. Our Father, indeed we are so thankful for your sufficient word. The best of all books. Thank you. Though we love to see your glory in creation, we admire your majesty in nature. We adore your greatness in the sunrise and the sunset and the clouds and the trees and the sun. Thank you for the brighter light, the better heat, the greater power that is found only in the scriptures. Thank you for your word that is perfect and sure and right and pure and clean and true. Thank you for your word that can restore me when my soul wanders, that can make me wise when I am simple. Thank you for all the times that your word has given joy when my heart is sad. Thank you for your word that brings light to my dark eyes and brings clarity to my confusion. Thank you for your word that is perfect and righteous and lasts forever. Thank you for how sweet it is and how it satisfies my soul and fills us with joy that can be found in no other place. Thank you for the warnings of your word that keep us away from sin and danger. Thank you for the rewards and the wages and the benefit of your word. Thank you that your word teaches us how to pray, how to confess sin, how to live holy. Thank you most of all, best of all, that your word points us to Jesus who is our rock, who is our redeemer, who is our only savior. I pray for each of my brothers and sisters here, for all the preachers in this room, especially that they would be faithful men who preach nothing less and nothing more and rely upon nothing but your word to be to do the your work in their churches and to display your glory and to transform their people to build their church and to establish their ministry. Oh, Lord, we thank you for revealing your word to us. We do not deserve your word. It is a gift of your grace, but we thank you for it. Where would we be without your word? We feel like Peter, who said to the Lord Jesus, where else can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. These words are spirit, and they are life. Your word is enough. May that be seen and demonstrated in the way that we preach, the way that we pray, the way that we counsel, the way that we live in our marriages, in our homes. May, the, may everyone around us see the difference that your word can make. The power of your word. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Sotra Nandriman, sika hain sotra manuka namni pastor Tim Contrella na mila cha anzai tina Nandriman sa isa ay tan sika fan tin Nandriman sa yan maniu ni fam lidi afi amizai tin nutri na tan sika fivi sa i amzofton zot sika ti i rusu am fiat tunakil zani am mandit ni to sika ro pulnitio am pirnit sika zani am ni full sasani ay cham fam pinahan afa ru fa afa kamiatukil zani sika mandit ni ro pulnitio.